So good afternoon. Uh, welcome on online discussion, the contemporary human rights situation in Central and Eastern Europe. My name is Sebastian Pickel. I'm managing director of Novum Institute, and I'm going to be your host for today. Uh, just before we start, um, there are some technical information for the speakers I would like to share. Uh, so please keep your microphones off um, if you don't speak uh, and camera on um, all the time. And uh, also there is a round sign below the video area with interpretation mark. You can choose uh, original uh, voice, uh, which is English, uh, but there is also a Russian translation uh, of this event. Uh, so, without further ado, um, now let us put this event into the context. Our debate today, um, as a background, uh, is going to use the publication with the same title, The Contemporary Human Rights Situation in Central and Eastern Europe. This publication uh, is a result of shared design between Friedrich Naumann Foundation, Russia and Central Asia office, Friedrich Naumann Foundation for Freedom for Central Europe and the Baltic States office, and the Novum Institute from Ljubljana, Slovenia. Uh, publication is also uh, available for download. Um, uh, I will later on uh, give you the address um, um, where you can download it. Um, but it's for downloadable from our dedicated web page, um, Human Rights in the 21st Century. So when we started to think about the publication in the fall of 2021, Central and Eastern Europe was a different place. Little did we know that in a matter of months, the biggest military attack in Europe after the World War II is going to start. But anyhow, we invited, even before that, seven authors to analyze contemporary human rights situation in seven states in Armenia, Belarus, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Hungary, Poland, Russia, and Ukraine. Each of the authors had the freedom to focus on the issues they regarded to be pressing in their country. But we also ask the authors to reflect upon some practical recommendations uh, for the international human rights community. What unites all the articles uh, is their belief in the utmost value of the individual rights and freedoms as a fundamental part of the modern world and the basis of individual security and welfare. At this time of multiple crises across Europe and the world, we believe Europe's communication with itself is of utmost importance. At the same time, the dialogue between cultural communities should be supported by knowledgeable information sharing and respectful debate. And this is what we are striving for. So today uh, we have with us authors who wrote articles on Hungary, Russia, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Belarus, and Poland. Uh, and I welcome them all. Um, but before that, um, I would just like to give uh, a short introduction to our supporters, to the representatives of our network partners and uh, supporters. So organizers of this project and the event are Friedrich Naumann Foundation, Russia and Central Asia office, together with Friedrich Naumann Foundation for Freedom for Central Europe and the Baltic States, which is also financing this event, and Institute Novum from Slovenia. So for the first address, I welcome uh, Barbara Krempaska, project manager from the FNF office of Central Europe and the Baltic States. Unfortunately, Mr. Lars Andre Richter and Ute Koslowski Kajaya could not join us because of some unforeseen obligations and illness. Anyhow, Barbara, it's good to, uh, you are here. Um, um, and this task actually now to present FNF belongs to you. So please, Barbara. Thank you very much, Sebastian. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon from Prague. 
Let me first just apologize again for our project directors, Lars, Andre, and Ute, who are sending you warm greetings. But it is a pleasure for me to welcome you on behalf of the Friedrich Naumann Foundation for Freedom, especially on behalf of our two offices, which worked together on this project, the Office for Central Europe and Baltic States in Prague, and Office for Russia and Central Asia, now in exile in Tbilisi. And I would like to express our gratitude to you, Sebastian, and to Institute Novum for putting this great project together and also for organizing these events as the discussion here is really important for us. Human rights is our core liberal value. And also the recent developments in our region have proved that the fight for basic human rights never ends, even in such developed countries in the middle of the European Union, if I'm speaking about uh, the region I am working in. We are following very worrisome situation, for example, in Hungary, in Poland, but recently also in Slovakia, where just last week the pro-Putin populists won the general election. Looking to the eastern side of the European continent, our concern is even bigger, considering the situation in Ukraine, Russia, or even nowadays again in Nagorno-Karabakh. The rise of illiberal voices in Europe make us all very concerned. And I am speaking here about the whole European continent, because as we also proved in our publication, the situation may differ in each country, but there are some trends which are repeating. So this project is a joint effort of these two offices of Friedrich Naman Foundation for Freedom and Institute Novum to preserve and strengthen the knowledge of the public and to strengthen the expert communication on the topic from the whole continent in order to reach our goals, it is crucial for us to communicate and work together to continue the dialogue between the West and the East. Because it doesn't matter whether we were born in Berlin, in Moscow, in Sarajevo or Yerevan, every human being deserves the same conditions and rights to live in dignity. And it is our duty to contribute to this through our work. Thank you very much for your attention and I wish you a fruitful discussion. Thank you, Barbara, for these inspiring words. Um, and uh, now um, I'm, I'm giving the word to Alia. Uh, Alia Stanko is a valuable part of Novom Institute for over 10 years. So what is Novom doing in the last years um, in the ways of uh, research and topics? Alia, hello. Hello. Thank you for the invitation and good afternoon from Salni Ljubljana. Uh, I will explain a bit about our work and the Institute and then I will leave the floor to the experts. So Institute Novum has been established in 2008 as a political foundation. And since then we have organized numerous conferences, seminars, discussions and trainings. Throughout the years, we have tackled many different topics from artificial intelligence, uh, blockchain, green energy, to social liberalism, future of co-working, and social entrepreneurship. In year 2020, we started with our ongoing project called uh, Human Rights in 21st Century in collaboration with European Liberal Forum. Within the project, we organized many online roundtables, shared some interesting podcasts and articles. We tackled topics such as senior citizens and their rights, rights to be human in the age of artificial intelligence, women's rights, COVID and global, uh, global vaccine solidarity, LGBTIQ plus rights and media freedom. Last but not least, we are very proud of our latest publication, uh, The Contemporary Human Rights Situation in Central and Eastern European, that we prepared in collaboration with our friends from Friedrich Naumann Foundation. We thank everybody for joining us today and we can't wait, wait to learn more from all of our panelists. That's all from me. So have a good debate. Thank you, Alia. 
Um, I wish you a lot of political willpower and good luck with your work, because I know that you started with, you are in a, um, uh, uh, in municipality of Vrhnika, so um, good luck. Uh, you, so yeah. um, let's go now um, to the debate. Um, uh, just, but before that, um, let me uh, introduce our key presenter, Anna Ivazian. Um, Anna is a se senior project coordinator at the Friedrich Naumann Foundation. Anna holds a PhD degree in political science. Uh, her research focus is the EU, EU foreign policy and Eastern partnership countries. She is also a co-editor of the publication. And uh, together with her, I think we did a valuable job. Um, please, Anna, give us some insight how this publication came about and why you believe it's important. Thank you so much, uh, Sebastian. I don't want to uh, take too uh, much time of uh, our uh, speakers, but I want to thank you, uh, Sebastian, for your initiative, uh, because it was exactly Sebastian who came up with the idea of a publication. And I think that uh, the main idea that lies in the basis of this project um, is the intention to create a communication platform for the uh, international human rights community. Uh, in the publication, you can read authors who come from uh, different countries, uh, including EU members and uh, non-EU members, which is important, I think, because um, there is some sort of institutional gap when we speak about uh, dialect between uh, our countries, specifically taken into account countries like Russia or Belarus that are not a part of um, European institutions and uh, that have quitted them. And besides that, we still have um, human rights activists who are in the countries and who do their job. I should also say that um, human rights um, currently might not be a very popular topic, uh, being quite often replaced by discussions about geopolitics, um, different uh, actors and so on. And quite often we just, um, I think, forget about um, uh, basic ideas um, that lied um, in the center of um, international order. Um, and um, I think that it is worth reminding um, the international community um, about them, uh, because unfortunately, we are at the point that um, all the countries um, that are depicted in the publication are going through a difficult time. I think that um, what we did well, from my point of view, is also uh, that we suggested each author to focus on a specific topic, which actually allowed uh, to see uh, the common agenda. Uh, in front of each, each one of us. And I should say um, that um, despite the difference between all the countries, there are also commonalities. And the common thing that one can observe there is that actually the downward trend in human rights sphere has been obvious uh, for at least a decade. So if you read all the articles, um, it is obvious that um, the human rights situation and uh, the difficulties we currently observe are not something that happened um, in one day. And I think that the last point I want to make is that uh, human rights work is um, day-to-day -day work connected to, uh, very much connected to 
everyday practices and everyday monitoring. Um, in this sense, it is very important that we have this pu publication that monitors the situation across uh, the European continent. And what I would like to uh, get as a result of this discussion is probably a certain um, action plan. So certain points, how to communicate better or uh, what exactly uh, to do to tackle the difficulties uh, described um, in the publication. Thank you so much. Thank you, Anna. Yes, we will definitely try to address some of the issue you pointed out, issues you pointed out either now or on our next events. Um, we are trying to um, um, talk about the publication or to disseminate the publication on in different countries, in different surroundings, so that the communication, actually a basic dialogue, can be um, heard and um, um, you know, um, and uh, and happening um, around these countries as well. So yeah, thank you for um, for your uh, introduction. Um, now uh, now we are moving uh, to the discussion part. Um, I'm going to introduce speakers as we progress. Uh, but uh, at, at this point, uh, four out of five speakers um, are here. We are still waiting for one. So maybe there is going to be a um, empty uh, black spot uh, at some point on the um, on the um, uh, on the monitor. Uh, but still, um, maybe we maybe we get all of them together. Um, so as it was already um, said several times, this publication presents a capture um, of a human rights agenda written by experts with quite diverse backgrounds. Some are uh, academic researchers, um, some are from cultural sphere or political analysts, uh, human, rights, human rights lawyers, um, public activists. And uh, we asked authors to reflect upon some practical recommendations for the um, international human rights community as well, not just um, um, uh, uh, analyzing their current situation. So, um, the articles had uh, have or had two, uh, let's say, two modes. Uh, one was descriptive, and one is to some extent prescriptive. Uh, but we are now in a quite, you know, um, in a situation where after a year, um, quite a lot has changed uh, in the countries. I already mentioned um, uh, the biggest. Um, uh, let's say aggression, the war in uh, Ukraine uh, of, um, after the Second World War. And, uh, and this, this actually did uh, change not just the situation in Ukraine, but in most of the surrounding countries. Um, not just mentioning uh, refugees, um, but also political um, processes which started to develop or um, get, got even in more intensive. Um, so we will talk about that as well. Uh, but uh, now, not to be too long, um, I will now invite our first speaker, uh, our first panelist, Eric Uskievich, who is a vice chairperson of Hungarian Europe Society based in Budapest, uh, to uh, share with us on one side um, what he wrote about, and uh, also later on, uh, on what's the situation now. So Eric um, described um, how Hungarian government is continuing to build an illiberal state, a phenomenon actually not really new to Hungarian state. The same term was also used and implemented during uh, last decades of 19th century, when Hungary was a part of Austro-Hungarian monarchy. Uh, and as he points out, uh, many breaches and restrictions in human rights are, are 
now being also promoted or um, implemented by the current government. One of the important or really or most important ones um, in your article, Eric, is the question of freedom of the press. Uh, so this is something we maybe would like to hear about. Uh, you highlighted media concentration and disinformation. How is the situation now, Eric? Hello. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon, and thank you for having me. Uh, so actually, as you've mentioned, uh, Hungary is experiencing this illiberal regime or illiberal government since 2010, when Viktor Orban, prime minister, came into power, actually returned to the power because he was a prime minister uh, earlier as well. And actually, uh, since then, after four consecutive uh, parliamentary election victory, uh, we are still experiencing uh, uh, the symptoms uh, and the causes and the consequences of this illiberal regime. Um, and as you've mentioned uh, in my article or in my chapter on Hungary, I've tried to summarize the key recent developments uh, related to this democratic backsliding and the situation of the human rights in Hungary. And I think one of the most important issue is the freedom of the press and the state of the media. So, for example, right now, if we are talking about the inflation, then I can say that in the European Union, amongst all the member states, Hungary is experiencing the highest inflation rate uh, among the 27 member states. And because there's this very strong and harsh uh, government-related propaganda, they can just over-communicate everything, even the problem with, the, with those uh, public services like the healthcare or the education, or for example, the everyday uh, everyday problems, what everybody can feel in, in their skin, uh, and for example, just doing the shopping in a, in a regular supermarket. So actually, in one of the most important uh, uh, part of my chapter was related to the press freedom, what I would like to summarize very briefly now, because we have only just a few uh, few minutes. And uh, what is very important that one of the first measures, one of the first measures of the Fidesz government um, uh, in, in 2011 was to adopt a new media, uh, 2010 was to adopt a new media law. Uh, and this legislative piece pr um, provoked very profound changes in the Hungarian media landscape. Um, I try to summarize now the most important uh, elements in nine points, very briefly. The first is uh, what you mentioned, this unprecedented level of ownership concentration. So, for example, uh, only the Central European Press and Media Foundation, which is a government, which is a, a foundation close to the government, owes more than 500 media outlets in one hand. So you can imagine the power of this foundation with 500 different outlets. The second is the diversity in the radio market, which has clearly declined. And this is that market sector where the media authorities' interference has had the most obvious impact. Uh, the third point is the ruling party dominated media council. So members of the media council were elected exclusively from Fidesz candidates, so from the ruling party candidates. So obviously they can serve the interest of the ruling party and the government. The fourth point is the market distorting impact of the state advertising. And um, you, you can maybe you've heard about these campaigns against uh, uh, Soros, uh, then the campaign against Brussels, than the campaign against the opposition parties and leaders. So actually, all of these uh, taxpayers' money uh, were able to build up a media empire, uh, which obviously has uh, a distorting uh, impact or a distorting element on the media market. The fifth point is the low propensity of consumers to spend money for content. So this is the free lunch problem. So actually, there are just a few people 
unfortunately more and more because uh, we can we can see some uh, very successful crowdfunding crowdfunding project but um, um, the number of the consumers who are willing and who are ready to pay for quality content is not that high the sixth point is the state news agency the hungarian news agency corporation which was consolidated into the public service media system and they have monopole position on the market the seventh point is that the public service media or it's better to call state media uh, has become the primary tool of the state controlled propaganda uh, and actually and this is the eighth point that um, the russian trolls or the russian propaganda doesn't have to make a lot of effort because the pro government media also plays a major role in spreading the russian propaganda amongst the uh, hungarians and the hungarian citizens and the the ninth and the last point is that journalists have just low credibility in the hungarian public and citizens tend to question whether they are independent whether independent journalism itself exists or not so this is the big picture related to the meat pre press uh, freedom of the press and uh, obviously then it's not a it's not a surprise that for example this year so in 2023 the reporters without borders run hungary just on the uh, 72nd uh, place in its press freedom index uh, out of 180 countries why this ranking in 2009 was the 25th and in 2010 it was the 23rd uh, so actually with this ranking Hungary has one of the worst rankings amongst the EU member states related to this press freedom index. And uh, just very briefly, uh, I, I would like to highlight another thing, which is uh, the, the state of the minorities and the, the minority issues, because the government's attacks have been targeting several people, groups, organizations, and uh, obviously minorities. And these problems have arisen in connection with the traditionally marginalized um, uh, communities uh, like the Romani people, uh, but also new pseudo enemies uh, appeared on the horizon like the LGBT community uh, or the refugees, migrants and asylum seekers. I don't want to go into the details uh, because uh, my time is, uh, I think, over. So I just uh, would like to say that obviously I'm open for questions and we will continue uh, this discussion at other occasions as well. And uh, during that speech, I will focus more on the LGBT community in Hungary. Thank you so much. Thank you, Eric. Um... Yeah, um, apparently uh, the backsliding is is getting um, um, even worse. Um, uh, the situation actually, um, yeah, uh, progress is not in the right direction, I would say. But anyhow, um, yeah, we will talk about it um, more. Uh, now, uh, our next panelist, um, thank you, Eric. The next panelist is uh, Professor Elena Lukianova, um, co-rector of Free Moscow University based in Latvia. Uh, Miss Elena um, wrote an article on Russia um, and she touches upon very basics of human rights protection after the events of February 24, 2022. Um, the imperialist war led by Russia so has drastically changed the entire human rights discourse established over the half of century. Uh, uh, so with the peace, uh, with the right to peace and the right to humanitarian assistance gaining now highest priority. Um, Ms. Lukanova, uh, how would you describe the situation now? Uh, what is going on um, in Russia uh, um, in the regards of human rights and um, uh, uh, and uh, uh, how would you describe the last year? Thank you. 
Спасибо большое, дорогие коллеги. So Я буду говорить по-русски. I will be speaking in Russian. Do excuse me for not being able to converse so fluently in English, but I really want to express my points. Let me draw out very briefly the points that I've described in my article and maybe ask a few new questions because the article was written almost a year ago and since then many things changed. So the first and foremost thing that the mission that we have, the mission that the researchers have, those researchers that are dealing with the human rights issues is the following. In the last hundred years, we have accumulated a number of generations of iterations of advancements of human rights, starting with the political rights and today, you know, latest cases of researches regarding um, healthcare, somatic rights, the, the way we call them. Yet, fundamentally, the theory of human rights and protection of human rights is based on the human rights that have been drawn out in the last hundred years. The right for peace, the right for humanitarian aid, the, the right for treat, right to treat war prisoners. Those rights were forgotten because war was not happening in the territory of Europe for so long. We need to reconsider those rights because we have read about them in the book, in the university. But today we're experiencing the real life horrible lesson that Russia is teaching the, the rest of Europe. We haven't seen this horrible lesson for decades and decades. And now researchers, professors in our university in particular are dealing with the issues of transitional law, the, uh, the issues of international court. How do you make people responsible? How the human rights, rights for peace could be protected? We, we ask questions about the structure of international collective security because it has to provide the right for peace in, in at least some way. That is a theoretical problem that every researchers, every researcher of human rights issues is facing today. And again, let me nod to the Hungarian researcher Zandra Shushaya, who is the classical researcher of contemporary constitutional law. He made a great contribution and keeps on working for this in particular. As for Russia and Russian experience, the things that happened in the last year since the article was written, well, let me tell you this, things got worse, much worse. Today we have the list of undesired or undesirable organizations, foreign agents, meaning organizations and individuals which are highly discriminated in the Russian society, liable for legal responsibility. The number of those organizations and individuals has increased significantly over 500 organizations and individuals 36 of them are working in our free university every friday the ministry of justice of the russian federation announces the new foreign agents again those people are very very highly discriminated compared to any other citizen of russia but the fact that we're speaking about it the fact that we are writing about it, the fact that we're trying to make it part of the media agenda. Well, think about it. Now this problem is seen and it's changing the context. For example, in Armenia, they wanted to adopt legislation on foreign agents. There was also an attempt in Kazakhstan to adopt legislation on foreign agents. But yet public is resisting, having seen where it leads to and both uh, projects of legislations were not fostered because Russian experience was a, a very illustrative example of how dangerous this kind of legislation is and how it can strike the human rights. Another invention of Russia, which fortunately no one is yet adopting, is the so-called undesirable organizations. This is much worse of a status compared to the foreign agent because if individuals are cooperating, interacting with uh, undesirable organizations, they actually 
are prosecuted based on criminal charges. Our university is the undesirable organization in Russia. And it took us about six months to figure out how do we preserve the security of our students. We are the online university, yet even online, we needed to design certain security protocols to prevent the risks of criminal prosecution for our students. And even those professors of ours who are still living in Russia, about 30% of our professors are still living in Russia. They're all experiencing a tremendous risk. That's why we're asking European universities to again, actually announce our courses and programs on behalf of those European universities. So that will make studying with our university secure. Another thing that has gotten much, much worse, independent media are literally non-existent in Russia at the moment. The last one was Novaya Gazeta, Novaya newspaper, the Novaya, which won the Nobel Prize, the Peace Prize. Its editor-in-chief won the Peace Prize last year, was awarded the Peace Prize. Um, the newspapers destroyed as it is in Russia, the printing uh, part of the newspaper is also destroyed. Same happened to the memorial, uh, NGO. People are under the threat of criminal prosecution or imprisonment, including the Nobel Prize winner, Peace Prize winner, Dmitry Muratov. After Russia quit in the European Council, it's hard to see who quit what, because European Council wanted to reject Russia, Russia wanted to uh, quit. So after this separation, after your, your Russia is no longer under the, the jurisdiction of European Human Rights uh, Court. The situation with the position of the Russian penitentiary system is very hard, much worse. Uh, Alexei Navalny in Russian prison is not simply tortured. His lawyer cannot even access uh, Alexei. It's impossible to pass documents to Alexei. Uh, the nourishment of Alexei is very much limited. He is literally starving. For about a year, Navalny cannot call his children. He is not allowed to see his family. The latest example is what happened two days ago. A very young lady, Sasha Skachelenka, in the city of St. Petersburg, was doing this thing in the supermarkets when instead of the price tags of products she was putting small anti-war statements she is now legally prosecuted she's not yet uh, considered guilty but she's taken to court every day she is deprived of water and food for days she goes back uh, to the imprisonment in the middle of the night and she is literally conscious losing consciousness because of sheer hunger and this is not some kind of individual outlier case. No, it's happening on a daily basis. Courts verdicts in the framework of prosecution of people who are saying things against war for just words can be up to 25 years. The municipal deputy at the meeting of the uh, municipal council, for example, when there was a discussion of the children's drawing, the deputy, the representative said, what kind of children's drawing contest can we host when there is a war? Well, the person got prosecuted for seven years for saying that. What can Europe do? Europe can save people, human rights activists, researchers, scientists, professors who are leaving Russia, need help, need support. We're helping people to leave. Yes, we understand that emotionally it's hard to treat Russian well now in Europe because that's... Russian is the language in which the order was written to start this war. Russian government is bombing Ukraine every day. Russian government started it all. That's clear. Yet we must preserve the potential, the social potential for those people who may change things. Sooner or later, the war will be over. Russia will be back in the European Council. And all of the violations of human rights for which those responsible were not prosecuted, 
must be registered so that people who are responsible would be responsible one day. We must register, we must journal, we must describe, we must analyze all of these cases, events and processes so that those who are responsible would be prosecuted and would bear the responsibility one day. In our university we have this lab, the lab of the, the so-called lab of intermediary stage and we invite different kinds of experts to participate in it in a preventive way we understand that the war will be over one day so we need to be prepared we need to design new legislation which we are doing we need to design electoral process we have written a book on elections when we have analyzed all of the negative dynamics of the legislation on elections trying to actually make a list of prescriptions that would prevent the degradation of elective legislation for example we're saying like if there's this kind of correction or change in electoral legislation that is a threat that is a warning that can lead to the chain of events that will violate the electoral process in the country the book will be translated by the new years into english it will be commonly available we are also promising to transfer this book to anna and we will publish it at every possible online platform that is a an outstanding research product and these are the points that i wanted to express happy to answer your questions uh, thank you very much Ms. elena um very interesting um uh, uh analysis um so um as i understood out of what you were saying is actually that at this point when the war is still ravaging the best way um for us to um for all of us to um respond as individuals is to remember to analyze uh to register uh everything we are able to and to communicate this between each other so for the time when so when the time arrives uh there are arguments and uh, there are memories uh and the data which will um put the current or any other government into uh let's say into the situation that they need to confront this data so this is quite important this is very important um and this is i think um uh something which we should uh, take out of this event as well can you comment a little bit more on this on the am i right um am i um speaking is is my um idea <inaudible> I believe yes, yes, that's what we're doing. And I that's why we're inviting for cooperation with the Free University. The human rights activists join our lab. We are actually releasing the magazine, the journal, it's called Palladium. It's being published in Latvia. And uh, we are openly and welcoming researchers to write for a magazine to actually estimate current state of events. We are ready to host researchers together and use the experience of Eastern European countries to actually, for example, prepare legislation on lustration, which is a very delicate subject, especially we're curious about uh, the experience of Poland. Some other countries would like to host lustrations, but it was not possible for certain reasons. I understand that in terms of human rights illustration is um, a very delicate tool. Yes, we are ready to work with that. We are inviting you to teach in our university as well, to teach in front of our students in the last two and a half years. We have um, released, um, we have actually trained over 15,000 people, 80% of those being Russians studying to change Russia in the future. So we are imploring you for support for the for university. Maybe we could find a partner university that will announce 
our courses and programs as part of their curriculum so that our students would not be legally prosecuted in Russia. Thank you, Elena. Um, thank you for this. Um, so uh, we'll talk about it uh, further on, uh, but at this point, uh, let's go on. Um, I'm uh, welcoming also um, Nedim Hogic from Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, Nedim is a freelance consultant and a human rights expert. And uh, uh, Nedim, hello. Hi, Sebastian. I'm glad you joined the panel. I'm glad that you invited me and I'm happy to be a part of this group. Actually, you know, um, when I was uh, I was reading uh, your article and um, uh, just like a few days ago again, um, I somehow in the current situation with it going on in Bosnia and Herzegovina, I actually um, sense or see some interventions of, uh, let's say, of Russia influence through Serbia and uh, uh, and in, in the Republic of Srpska and so on. And the, I, I some have a, somehow have a feeling that that quite a lot uh, going on now in Bosnia is is a kind of is um, escalation of 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 this uh, narrative which we are talking about, you know, um, Central and Southeast Europe and the war in Ukraine and the, the, the kind of a geopolitical forces being pushed around. Um, you actually, in your article, wrote about uh, how Bosnia for some time uh, in Herzegovina is sometimes struggling with the Dayton Peace Agreement. Uh, and you um, uh, focused quite a lot of civil and political rights uh, and also social and economic rights, but, but mostly on civic and political rights. So um, uh, can you describe this peculiar situation uh, of Bosnia and Herzegovina now when there are three constitutive na native nations in, in the country, but the um, forces trying to pull them, uh, push or pull them apart are getting even stronger. Well, yes, uh, thank you. So uh, the, the context of Bosnia and Herzegovina is really uh, special because it's a post transitional, post conflict and uh, pre enlargement or if enlargement fails, it's a post enlargement uh, country. So there's a lot of adjectives there to describe what's a situation basically in which the country is governed by a constitution that institutionalizes ethnic divisions because it has you know, ethnic vetoes, because it has ethnic quotas, because it uh, designates that only those who belong to a certain ethnic group may come, may be uh, some of the highest representatives uh, coming from a particular territory. So for example, the Bosnian presidency, which is the collective head of state is composed of three members that are, elect, uh, that are elected in a process that you could describe as democratic with some flaws. But uh, from Republika Srpska, which is, constitutes 49% of the country with a currently a Serb majority population, only a Serb uh, can uh, run for the presidency and only a Serb can become a member of the presidency. Likewise, the other entity or a federal unit, if you want, Federation of Bosnia and Herzegovina, which is predominantly inhabited by Bosniak and Croat ethnic groups, only Bosniaks and Croats may run for presidency. And this is something that goes through the entire system, these system of quotas, ethnic divisions and vetoes. But at the same time, you have a very high degree of institutionalization of human rights and a very, uh, I wouldn't say strong, but uh, strongly designed human rights institutions still continue to exist and operate. And there is this awareness still of a mobilization potential from the human rights. So you constantly live through this tension between collective and individual rights and a very high degree of fragmentation, which comes not only from the uh, rather uh, strong divisions between the ethnic groups, but particular electoral system, which actually fosters this due to its uh, very high 
uh, uh, representation repre uh, due to it being designed to offer a high degree of representation it also uh, comes with a high degree of fragmentation which is why you have so many political parties and which is why it's hard to create a coalition that would bring the country towards the EU and towards the protection of human rights. So instead, what happens very often, and I will just answer to your question and that get, then get back to the paper, is that basically there is a, a strong uh, in conservative influence and radical right-wing influence that is uh, goes across the country but is mostly felt in uh, Republika Srpska or by Republika Srpska politicians because they tend to align themselves with the uh, forces uh, from Russia, from Hungary, and also to signal towards other radical right-wing uh, politicians in the EU that they are somehow representative of true conservative Europe. And recently, and we see often, and, and I write about this in my chapter, how they invoke that they are uh, anti-gender ideology or that they try to ban uh, any gatherings that would gather or be organized in order to foster the promotion of the LGBT rights or the LGBT community. And recently, unfortunately, we have a legislative proposal now there that aims to copy the Russian law on foreign agents. And to uh, and I don't write about this in the chapter because this was already in the table on the table in 2015 and it was rejected. Uh, the law was withdrawn because uh, even even many in Republika Srpska thought that this was just a step too far. But now I know that many of these people who thought so are no longer in politics. So uh, unfortunately, we see in Republika Srpska that uh, there is a great probability that this will, law will be passed very soon and that they will try basically to destroy what's left of the civil society sector in that part of the country. So in that sense, freedom of association, which I thought was not endangered and which I mentioned in my paper is now coming under pressure in half of the country. And uh, active and passive electoral rights uh, remain limited despite judgments of the European Court of Human Rights, uh, whose implementation requires constitutional reform. So these, uh, what I mean by this, are these rights to appoint, uh, no, sorry, to vote for and to run for uh, candidates that come from um, any ethnic group in uh, any uh, uh, entity when it comes to appointments to the uh, presidency of Bosnia and Herzegovina, but also to many other positions which are uh, uh, less uh, mentioned. So basically the demands from the European Court of Human Rights go into this direction that the country should gradually abolish or uh, at least part of its uh, discriminatory uh, constitution. Uh, the situation here is unclear. Uh, the European Union at this point is willing to um, let country go ahead, or at least it doesn't consider this as important as it considers fight against corruption and some other policy priorities. But in the long run, uh, what got us into this problem was precisely the fact that not only integration moved way too slow, when 15 years ago it became very fashionable to talk about uh, enlargement fatigue, to talk about how the EU may not absorb the Western Balkan countries, although we know now with uh, Moldova and Ukraine, uh, enlar uh, the enlargement of the EU to these countries, we know basically how much of a mistake it was to think like that. And it's sad to see that now uh, European Union, only because of security concerns, understands uh, that basically it should offer a lifeline through this enlargement process to these two countries. But uh, I don't see the issue of constitutional reform, which would help us erase these uh, or uh, resolve at least some of the questions with civil and uh, political rights uh, in this moment. Uh, the chance for an internal cohesion and an internal agreement is not very is not very big 
On a positive note, uh, at least freedom of expression due to this high fragmentation remains um, strong, remains uh, uh, defended in the public sphere. So at least you can voice your opinion, although we have seen also in Republika Srpska the recriminalization of libel as a political uh, 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 proposal which has been adopted and uh, which, which could lead to prosecutions of journalists. This hasn't happened yet. And the punishments that are, the, the penalties envisaged by the, by the law are not too high, but still it's a, it's a, dangerous, uh, it's a dangerous thing. Uh, corruption remains a problem and we see this, especially in the realization of some economic and social rights. Uh, businesses are often extorted for money. It's difficult to start your own business and expect that it will flourish unless you are in some sort of a clientelist network. Likewise, uh, the right to health and protection of health remains contested because of the petty corruption in the health sector, which undermines really the performance of the sector as a whole. Uh, the It is not the problem of expertise that you don't have you know, good doctors, it's not even so much a problem of equipment. It's a problem that the, the, the healthcare and the right to healthcare remains uh, difficult to realize again if you're not a part of some uh, clientelist uh, network. Likewise, um, I feel that uh, many of, of the patients who suffer, and, and it has been documented and it's going on now, that many of the patients who suffer from um, some of the most difficult uh, and uh, horrible diseases cannot get a proper treatment because the government is unable, and this is a problem, especially in federation, where government is unable to fund uh, the treatments. And then what you see is people try to gather money on their own. And then this leads you know, to uh, criminal activities and misappropriation of funds. And one of the uh, uh, most interesting corruption cases has been actually a, a case where one of these um, allegedly humanitarian networks for collection of funds was uh, captured, uh, was, was caught by the police misappropriating these funds. So this tells you about the failure of the state to perform some duties, but also that, you know, when private initiative steps in, that we don't see this, that, that we often see that private initiative doesn't also uh, uh, resolve resolve the problem. Um, more widely, uh, and of course, speaking, you know, after Ellen and I, I, I am listening to what she said, I feel that like our problems are not that important, uh, or rather that they pale in comparison to these uh, horrible elements of dictatorship. So Bosnia is not a dictatorship, and it's not on the verge of a coup, but it's almost ungovernable. And uh, we look uh, with with great anticipation to what will happen in the next months, and we we hope that you know, since Moldova at least uh, is now we we have seen today a resolution of the European Parliament uh, advocating for opening of the uh, chapters and accession process towards Moldova, and we we hope really that a similar stance is taken by the EU towards Bosnia because we um, need some sort of an external incentive and external influence that would more effectively counter, you know, the, the Russian influence and possibly other influences because they are not just, you know, powers competing for influence. They bring certain values with them. And the values that are brought here by uh, the Russians by the Russian government directly undermines the what little we have managed to build over uh, as as a part of the liberal democratic order in our country. And so for these reasons, uh, uh, th so those are, you know, that's the general overview. These are the topics I have I have tackled in, in um, greater detail in the in the paper. And, and that's the situation, so to say, now uh, briefly, but I'm prepared to answer more questions later if needed. Thank you, Nedim. Um, yeah, um, actually, you, you mentioned, and I want to stress as well, um, uh, one of your um, uh, uh, recommendations um, uh, from the article, uh, 
to consider um, uh, to start a countrywide dialogue to change uh, the existing constitutional text um, um, in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Um, so um, the, um, the Dayton um, agreement uh, um, actually saved the um, situation um, few, um, a decade and a half ago. Uh, but now it is, uh, uh, as, um, as understood, it is outdated. Um, so the um, governability is being now, you know, is the question. And um, this is something maybe which, uh, you know, which is important um, in your text. And I also important, you know, it's also important to um, uh, put across, you know, put uh, as a... Um, let's say as a um, as something as a recommendation of the publication and of your article do you have anything to add to this well yes i i just want to add that i hope really that uh in the years to come uh we will get a, a greater chance for some uh, mobilization that would work towards a, a uh, constitutional reform that would offer us a more strong protection of human rights and that we sort of manage to, I mean, the issue never went off the agenda. It's just that we need to actually do something about it. And I, I hope we are, we shall be supported in this mission. Okay. Uh, thank you for your contribution at this point. Um, so let's go on. Um, next is uh, uh, Mikolai uh, Pachkayev. Um, he is based in um, uh, Great Britain, uh, but he's a chair of the Association of uh, Belarusians in Great Britain. Um, uh, Mr. Pachkayev, hello uh, from my side. Um, so your focus in the article was on cultural rights uh, and the right to the usage of Belarusian language. Actually, when I was reading it, uh, your article, um, I was actually, I was appalled by violent breaches of rights targeted at persons due to um, their preference of using the Belarusian language. It's, um, un, un, you know, I was, it was uh, ununderstandable how, uh, a, 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 a native language of a country is treated so widely, uh, so wild and, and uh, with disrespect. Um, um, could, you, um, could you share with us some, um, let's say, some information from the article, some describe a little bit about what you wrote and also what is going on now uh, in, in Belarus? When, when we spoke a little bit um, just before the event, I said that actually not a lot um, in, of information is coming out to the regular media, um, European media. Uh, um, you know, actually it was a year ago with a, a kind of a, um, let's say, um, start of the, uh, of the public, um, uh, a kind of a revolution. Actually, there was a lot of talk about the state, but now after the the aggression of Russia against Ukraine, um, this this um, wave somehow somehow at least in the sense of uh, information sharing or, or or media information mainly mainstream media is not so prevalent. You actually said that in. Uh, let's say in the um, more um, closed groups or more um, specific groups, there is a lot going on. Um, a lot of um, information sharing. And as, um, as uh, Ms. Um, Luciano already said, a lot of analysis um, and registration of what is going on is, uh, is, is being um, um, debated and, and um, uh, and probably also um, memorized. Um, but um, can you can you please describe, as I said, uh, a little bit about what is going on now with the usage of the the, the language and um, what's the current situation now in Belarus? Um, thank you. Um, um, I will 
speak a bit about why I picked up this um, topic and um, if I actually uh, forgot to comment on anything you've just raised, uh, could you please remind me um, at a later point? Can you hear me well now? Yes, we can hear you. Oh, we can right. hear you well. Um, um, right. Um, first of all, I'd like to join in uh, congratulating the organizers and publishers of uh, this volume. And, um, I think, uh, um, and thank you for, uh, for this opportunity uh, to contribute um, with my input on Belarus. So um, I would like to comment now basically on why I picked up this uh, topic uh, as my subject and um, um, what I can make out of it, having spent some considerable um, time researching it for this article. And thank you, Anna, for your comments. I think that retrospectively, we have we had arrived to this situation by 2022 when uh, a new large war in Europe became possible, not without a decade of uh, deterioration. And that deterioration included the, the human rights field uh, very, very clearly. Um, now, when I under, undertook to write, uh, to write my contribution on Belarus, um, I set myself a task um, for it to be different from what you normally find in human rights publications. Um, that is not to be just a recount of just how bad it is and um, lamentations on the regime's intransigence and brutality. Um, and in a way, the case of Belarus stands out in a few respects, um, such as um, it's been a problem for nearly 30 years now. Um, then the severity um, uh, of, of brutality, whereby the reported cases of torture have been in hundreds and a few killings from time to time, and the legal, uh, the, even the formal legal and political uh, context that is uh, Belarus uh, has a uh, Belarusian government, uh, neither Lukashenko government, of course, uh, nor even the previous government, have um, ever joined the European Convention of um, Human Rights or any other related framework of international human rights regime. Um, the sheer number of persons uh, affected uh, um, uh, is, is just a, a quantity that has its own quality, as people say. It's been reported that just since last um, summer, uh, uh, sorry, since the summer of 2020, the number of persons who uh, served, who were handed down custodial sentences for political reasons have been in, in excess of 47,000 persons in Belarus. Um, and over the couple of years, um, the number of long-term political prisoners has been in, in around uh, 1,500 and growing. And new arrests are made all the time. And um, uh, for example, death penalty has been expanded in law to, uh, to a new range of non-violent offenses. Um, I will uh, remember to mention where you can sort of follow this information because this, uh, the arrests are happening just every day, it's every day thing. Um, so given the case of Belarus stands out, uh, I wanted to approach it in a way to look for where to start analytically untangling its um, interrelated and mutually feeding set of problems. And in order to do that, I deliberately considered and focused on in my article at um, an issue that is very Belarus specific in that region, that is um, uh, violence and similar coercive acts by the, uh, the various officers of the Lukashenko regime in Belarus against those members of the public who prefer to use the Belarusian language or who insist on uh, exercising that right, which is formally speaking still enshrined in law, uh, since the uh, early 1990s, uh, before Lukashenko brought Russian back as official language. Um, so it is an unusual, uh, an unusual aspect uh, of, uh, 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 of that situation uh, of human rights violations. And I was thinking about its potential implications for interpreting the situation in Belarus at large. Um, the only similar case, uh, as, as I say, it's very appalling to read about it, but the only similar, uh, kind of similar case of uh, government suppressing um, the culture of a nation from which uh, the state authority actually takes its name is in the so-called uh, Transnistrian Moldovan Republic, which is actually anti-Moldovan, 
in its uh, cultural language policies, and um, that uh, the, the case uh, had reached the European Con uh, Court of Human Rights uh, at the time, and Transnistria, the Transnistrian so-called Moldovan Republic, was recognized by that court, by the European Court of Human Rights, as being effectively under Russia's um, uh, de facto um, occupation, as they, they, they call it. Um, other similar cases, um, instances were found in uh, um, Crimea and areas of uh, Eastern Donbass, those areas that have been effectively under Russian uh, proxy occupation or directly under Russian occupation. Now, um, you can find um, in my article an account of such violent incidents in Belarus over the years, which I argue amount to a consistent de facto policy. And in my observations, um, uh, there is a dynamic uh, in time, which I describe in my paper. So in, in that conclusion, I would say that uh, when you have a severe problem, it usually has more than a, a single reason. So my observ um, uh, observations based on that empirical study has been that in Belarus, you have a multidisciplinary situation uh, and the most important aspects um, of which, apart from the classical human rights agenda, of course, um, from uh, most notably, uh, effectively, the post-colonial paradigm and the security paradigm of analysis. Now, the security aspect in particular about the government's actions has become more obvious and more prominent uh, in the context of Lukashenko's supporting uh, Russia in, uh, in uh, Putin's war against Ukraine, um, as well as uh, in Lukashenko's hostile gestures against Poland. What I think the value of that analysis can be, uh, it is in establishing the uh, potential right order of resolving uh, the problems. So that to arrive eventually to uh, an improvement of human, right, of human rights situation in the country, um, uh, and, and just ac across the board, in a sense. Uh, and establishing that order by uh, finding out how the problems are uh, interrelated and what problems are feeding what other problems. Uh, that should give um, a reasonable strategy and tactics so that we know we need to take, uh, or as I say, suppress an enemy position A in order to take enemy position B, uh, figuratively speaking. Uh, for example, in many situations, uh, the developing, in the developing world, uh, we know that uh, when post-colonial factors um, are important, it is difficult to resolve the overall human rights problem um, uh, or to remove obstacles to that resolution or to restore or to develop some proper rule of law and democracy and progress towards liberal values without dealing with some other, such as local social economic matters. And so we need to be asking similar questions and to have a practical strategy regarding such uh, a complicated and um, uh, entrenched human rights problem as exists in uh, Belarus. And what has been virtually a problem for the last nearly 30 years. Now, what has changed uh, over the last year? Um, the most, um, Tragic thing I should uh, uh, I should mention is that one of the persons whom I spoke as a, um, a living person at the time in my article has died in prison. That was um, Ales Pushkin, um, a uh, widely known um, uh, Belarusian artist. He was um, his uh, imprisonment uh, had an aspect of. Uh, he has uh, been in favor of using the Belarusian language, and he was uh, beaten for that, and eventually he died in prison um, after I had drafted my, my article. Um, the, now, regarding the war, um, as I've commented in my article, uh, there was, uh, it was a factor of both continuity and deterioration uh, that the war had brought about. Um, the intense political repression in Belarus actually predated the war, that needs to be made clear, um, including uh, in that specific area that I was like. Uh, but the war, uh, first of all, had eliminated any chances of the situations coming down in a way, as it had after the repression in uh, 2010. 
Uh, and then the war secondly created new motivations uh, for an escalation of repression by the Lukashenko government. Um, now, speaking of, uh, of human rights overall, um, following the war, we have new examples of a new particular type of political, political prisoners in Belarus, whereby people are handed down severe penalties for actions uh, meant fundamentally to prevent uh, Putin's war crimes in uh, Ukraine using Belarus territory. And those are not recognized um, as proper political prisoners or human rights violations because uh, war crime prevention is not one of the classical human rights um, if done in forms exceeding the right to expression. And that is, of course, probably, um, I'd say, um, a matter shared with the uh, Russian um, anti-war uh, movement and people who uh, take part in that. Now, speaking specifically of, of the cultural rights and language rights, yes, the situation has deteriorated um, uh, following the war. Um, while previously, uh, Belarusian symbols and uh, language preference and cultural preference were portrayed uh, by the Lukashenko regime as uh, or suspected of being an expression of disloyalty um, domestically. Uh, so now the, the uh, persecution is also claiming um, uh, the linkage to Ukraine, some linkage to Ukraine. So this is beyond the use of language now. For example, uh, for example, the official charges um, against someone from the Lukashenko uh, oppression agencies just a few days ago, um, in Belarus, uh, where that this uh, traditional uh, slogan, uh, long live Belarus, uh, it's a traditional slogan um, originating from the early 20th century, um, uh, uh, has been, uh, uh, they claim, modeled, modeled, um, uh, modeled on Ukrainian nationalist, or as they label it, Nazi, uh, as they label everything Ukrainian Nazi, more or less, uh, slogans. So everything of the Belarusian national cultural agenda in Belarus, not just the language, can now be branded as pro-Ukrainian uh, by the Lukashenko government, uh, which is very dangerous in the context of uh, the war which Lukashenko uh, supports Russia on. So, the, uh, uh, so this anti-Belarusian cultural cleansing since the beginning of the war has expanded and intensified with references to its presumed um, or it's portrayed being also uh, a kind of Ukrainian related uh, thing. Um, and thirdly, and uh, just uh, across the board, um, uh, in this war situation, there's a tendency by the Lukashenko government, and of course, not just by the Lukashenko government, to uh, what's called in English, securitize or to or militarize uh, more often than not abusively a lot of issues that should uh, reasonably be ring fast as non-competent matters uh, in every sense of the world. Uh, there's a notion, for example, in English of lawfare made of uh, legal warfare, that is the abusive employment or uh, claim of employment of law, ultimately for some military and defense reasons or outcomes. But looking back at, uh, over the years, um, I'd say Lukashenko cultural policies and hostility uh, towards the Belarusian culture and language in Belarus have been influenced by the uh, state of his defense and security alliance with Russia uh, 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 or what he thinks Russia would approve and appreciate as evidence of his defense and security loyalty in exchange for Russia's economic support and security guarantees uh, provided to him. Uh, now, one perhaps um, trivial but crucial points that I would uh, add is that repelling Putin's aggression, we need to keep in mind what we are defending. This war is not about just a, a dispute put out between states about high politics. Um, Ukraine has to fight and be supported in that by the international community to protect the lives of the uh, victims of aggression, but also to defend people's right to live in an environment of freedom and human dignity. So this war is, um, in a way, a, a very much a humanitarian and human rights action. 
And it's a tragedy that it all needs to be now defended with arms in hand. Um, and to uh, respond to your um, question, yes, uh, human rights, uh, uh, rep well, political repression and all sorts of human rights abuses in Belarus is a, a matter of everyday life there. Um, the major uh, organization that monitors and publishes this information is called Viasna, uh, uh, spelled as uh, V I uh, A, no, sorry, V I A S N A, Viasna. Uh, which was um, headed, or we should say probably still headed by Alex Belaski, a, a Nobel uh, Prize winner uh, from Belarus, who is a political prisoner in Belarus. Uh, they have uh, uh, some very good uh, monitoring service utilizing a lot of uh, uh, sources. Uh, uh, some of the sources they have uh, surviving in Belarus, but also they are able to pick up and monitor official sources for any suitable and you know, put things together in the right context. So Vyasna is uh, the major source of such information and they are not politically biased. Uh, they have no political agenda. They are proper uh, right, uh, human rights uh, monitoring um, organization, which I very much rec uh, recommend. And, and there you find a, um, a, a a lot of uh, information, human rights abuses of all kinds, uh, from religious, uh, LGBT rights, uh, and of course, that includes, unfortunately, the suppression of the uh, Belarusian culture and language by the government of the center in Belarus. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pachkayao. Um, that was... Um, uh, a good description um, and thank you for sharing um, all of this with me with us uh, I have now um, one topic uh, still to open with all of you um, which I feel uh, it came to uh, somehow to the forefront uh, after most of your uh, presentations actually from our perspective here as let's say as a kind of a non-governmental organizations as uh, political foundations. Um, um, what we can actually, what we can do is to inform, um, to communicate and uh, so on. But there is, there is this connection also, which I noticed or felt uh, um, between um, migration in in last in the time now um a refugee crisis and education actually all of the countries which we are now um talking about have in one way or another problems with um let's say or um not having problems or maybe this is becoming a problem with um academic freedom um eric also already wrote in the article about what uh, illiberal state under quotes is doing to let's say to damper or or um, um, influence um, um, academic uh, freedom in Hungary, um, Miss Lukanova actually uh, was talking about um, free university, which is online teaching um, uh, how to. Um, um, uh, how to be better prepared for the time after the the war, after the aggression. Um, Nedim also um, uh, um, uh, uh, mentioned uh, um, the issue with gender studies, which are being uh, uh, on, uh, let's say, on um, on an attack side uh, in in Bosnia and Herzegovina. And uh, I can imagine uh, that also in Belarus, academic freedom is something which uh, is uh, not really um, exist existing. So could you, um, all of you actually share a little bit uh, on the situation in your countries regarding this and, uh, and how um, how could we, um, how can we as a, uh, as I said, NGOs and um, political foundations 
actually support to at least to some extent this um, 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 uh, this um, let's say um, um, force or be a force to to support and promote academic freedom and as much of um, analysis as possible. Eric, please. We'll start with you. Okay, so because. So far, nobody has shown. I will show the, the publication what we are talking about. So yeah. this is now time for the direct promotion of our love, our wonderful uh, publication. And actually, um, if I if I understood correctly, I think uh, you ask two questions in one sentence. So I would refer uh, one by one for the two parts. The first thing is in connection with the role of the NGOs, political uh, foundations and civil society uh, organizations. I don't like or I don't want to say that we don't know how the situation would be and how the situation would be even worse without the, the activity and the operation of these uh, NGOs, not just in Hungary and in the, in the region, but also beyond. So I think uh, the monitoring, the information, what we can provide to the general public um, and the, the continuous evaluation of the situation. So this kind of watchdog function is extremely important, not just in Hungary or in the region, but also in, in many other uh, countries. And uh, we were also referring to this. So I just would like to say one thing and I would like to react after uh, the speeches of the other panelists that uh, what I'm used to also mention that uh, it's hard to compare the difficulties and the seriousness of the situations in the different countries. So there we, if, if we look around, we always find a country which is in a worse situation than, than ours. So actually, I think we should understand, evaluate um, and react to the human rights situations in every country in their own context. Uh, and I think it's very important. And related to the academic freedom, um, as you may probably know, there are harsh attacks against the academic freedom in Hungary, for example. So maybe you know that the Central European University, which was a kind of flagship higher education institution in the country uh, has to move out from Hungary and now it's operating from Vienna. Uh, there's, there are harsh attacks against the gender studies in the country. Uh, also, uh, the government is trying to somehow to limit the autonomy of the Hungarian Academy of Sciences. Uh, and uh, and uh, there are some other, other issues related to the to the universities, as they call it in the in the um, government framework, these model changes uh, is going on in the country, which means that uh, public foundations uh, are the main uh, decision makers at the universities, and this is quite an issue right now with the EU and the European Commission as well. So this is one of the hard milestones or hard uh, struggle what Hungary has to solve somehow in order to get the EU funds, which are still blocked by the European Commission. Uh, and uh, from, from our perspective, from an NGO perspective, I think what we can do is to support the autonomy and the academic freedom uh, as many ways and as much as possible uh, because um, actually we are talking about uh, uh, the future generation and their role in the society. So actually what was quite uh, uh, a bit shocking to, to see that, for example, just a few percentage of the Hungarian society was concerned about the, the role and the importance of the Central European University, for example. Uh, so actually, I think this is one of the most important tasks from our perspective uh, to support the academic freedom as much extent as possible, because they are still keeping some parts of the uh, of the autonomy and the 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 relevance of the autonomy. 
which could be a kind of role model for a lot. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, exactly. This this is one of my points. Actually, I, I wanted to go even a, a little bit deeper because I, I sensed, you know, as Miss uh, Luciano said, you know, uh, that, uh, you know, she said that um, the Open University actually educated over 15,000 individuals in last um, period. Um, and um, it's uh, it's actually it's education. It's probably one of the rare um, forces with which um, um, one can tackle dictatorships. And uh, at the end, after the after the let's say the um, armed conflict, um, because you know this is this is the choice um, we have now. Let's say how to um the the armed conflict is going to end with a with a conversation at the end you know it's not going you know all armed conflicts end with the conversation but then the second phase is that uh that those who are going to um um try to either rebuild or or um restructure um um or um um uh uh, renew um, the, the 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 situation the, the 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 on one side in Ukraine but also in Russia and in other states uh, we'll need to have you know we need to know how how the democratic process functions how um, uh, uh, how uh, knowledge um, actually supports the um, democracy and um, in this sense um, I'm actually um, um, somehow uh, I'm asking, or maybe I'm, I'm maybe asking for a comment, Miss Luciano again, um, um, uh, to explain a little bit uh, how they are doing it. Um, you know, um, academic freedom actually um, of Russians now it's, as I understand, stationed outside of Russia, and um, and um, and the process of of educating. Um, individuals who are either still in Russia and educating them online or those who are outside is um, needs to be stationed outside of Russia if at least some kind of academic freedom uh, um, is, let's say, um, um, it's possible. Um, so yeah, Ms. Lukanova, can you comment on this? What uh, um, on on this on this issue? How um, you know? Um, as I said, um, education is important. Academic um, freedom is in pearls. Um, per, uh, and uh, what is here? Um, let's say um, um, a kind of a either a way out or a way at this moment. Here's what can I tell you. Let me give you my individual example. In our free university, we have now 208 professors, all of, all of them members of the academia of the top level, young, mature, distinguished. All of them have either been fired from Russian universities or research institutions, or they those people are still in Russia and they believe that they need to teach young people, and not only young people, face-to-face, -face, life, not online. When there were six of us here, when we put together the free university that happened in September 2020, right after Putin actually radically changed the constitution of the Russian Federation, and uh, Putin literally monopolize the entire power in Russia. So those six of us who were fired, we sat down and said to ourselves, we don't need a building, we don't need classrooms, we're ready to teach from home, from the library, from our kitchen, from the beach. But we have written down a set of values, and our main value is academic freedom. University is not about walls. University is not about governmental financing. University is about professors who teach there. And right away, another 15 professors joined us. So we had the first semester of the Free University, September 2020. And we have announced 20 courses, and we had six and a half thousand applications for those. Now, 
there are 200 people of us and every semester we announce about 50 courses and now we have three major two years master's program media schools public law we are governed by electoral bodies our rectors are rotated we come together in zoom we live all over the world and we teach our students while preserving our academic freedom when um, russian quit the european system of education uh, the balloon system we announced that we're not quitting the system and all of our systems and courses were adapted for european credit system we are designing our courses according to the european credit system so that's how we can preserve academic freedom while being independent while keeping professors independent yes we have people who are financing our activities we have not been looking for those people they came to finance us and the number of our sponsors the list of our sponsors is only increasing for example american bar associations which is financing our school of hands-on law some some institutions are financing our uh, media school now we're having this lab for intermediary stage of uh, the, the research of intermediary stages when we are describing the way you can design legislation for this transition period when country is coming back to civilization if i may say so we need researchers we need the people who would join that's also part of academic freedom yes we are the undesired organization in russia we have adopted security protocols to maintain our academic freedom we are very strict about it we have the charter we have the procedure we have the board etc now another point look in europe there are 14 million people speaking russian in europe yes they speak the languages of the countries where they live in but yet 14 million of people live in europe and speak russian out of those 14 million some people a lot of people actually support putin and war a lot of them and they need to be educated as well because you need not only demilitarize the territory but also consciousness you need to decolonize de-imperialize the consciousness people need to be educated belarusians are amazing they agreed with their neighbors and in vilnius there is licensed belarusian humanitarian university where belarusian researchers work online and offline that's just the actual traditional university and of course that's very close to the country of belarus and um, refugees from russia from belarus can study there we're not claiming to build walls for our university but we need the right to be accredited at the european level we will be online we're not requesting for money but we need to teach people both in russia and outside we have a lot of courses not only in russian we have ukrainian italian professors belarusian professors we need the right to do that on a legal basis we need legal aid we need legal assistance to pre, pre preserve academia because human rights and this is my main point human rights they begin with education human rights is education human rights is intelligence countries were arriving to the human rights to the notion of human rights for centuries from the first parliaments and democracies to magna carta to constitutions to the bill of rights and people were fighting and dying for their freedom 
as Ruth Ginsburg, for example, was fighting for one issue her entire life. It's, you know, like, like it's like squirrel getting the nut and holding it. People realize that when they have rights, when they are educated, then they can have those rights. And that's when people become citizens from the capital C. We need to cherish each other. We need to gently cherish one another. The war, the war will be over, but you will have the huge chunk of Eastern Europe without democracy, but with dictatorship. Democracies do not war. Authoritarian regimes go to war. We need to teach people. We need to educate people. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for for these words. Um, I'm um, I'm glad you uh, you explained as you did um, um, with a concrete example and uh, with the background of uh, what actually constitutes the the uh, a citizen of a country of a democratic country. Um, thank you, uh, Nedim. You also mentioned um, um, the issue of gender studies being. Um, um either debated uh, by the government um and um being on the let's say on the uh on the side of um where academic freedom is uh, is maybe lacking uh, can you describe the, the uh, how this came about uh, because I, I was not really aware of it um uh, but apparently there is an issue with academic freedom also in bosnia and herzegovina it's not so much about academic freedom per se, but rather the attempt to and, and the intention to uh, limit whatever uh, gender studies mean for Mr. Dodik. So the idea is basically that uh, he would fight, you know, gender propaganda. And I'm quoting this and obviously it doesn't make too much sense because there's a... Uh, First of all, little what you could describe as such present in the discourse. Bosnia and Herzegovina, owing to the support of Sweden and some other donors, had an MA, uh, one MA course organized at the University of Sarajevo, or rather MA degree in gender studies. And that degree was issued to some, I don't know, maybe 60 people across the region. And it was a successful program that lasted for maybe about a decade or, or maybe eight years. And then it ceased to exist uh, like seven or eight years ago. And uh, because uh, less people were applying from the region, there was a tuition fee, there was something like that. Uh, there was a combination of factors that led to the end of the program. Now, the reason why I'm mentioning this is this is the only, you know, institutionalized uh, 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 course in something that you could call gender studies. So there is a non-existent threat. Uh, what Mr. Dodik, in my opinion, referred to was, you know, virtue signaling or rather uh, 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 signaling of an authoritarian tendency to his supporters uh, among the radical right-wing parties in Europe uh in hungary and in russia there is little you know propaganda you could fight off you could fight we barely managed to organize uh three pride marches since 2019 same-sex marriages are not legal in bosnia the legal text that was supposed to be used for the adoption of this solution was prepared years ago it has never been submitted to the parliamentary procedure um, in a wider context, you could say that the, the issue of academic freedom uh, so far didn't get too much attention, um, quite because there's little engagement in academic independence from the Bosnian academics. They are rather, um, I wouldn't say not too much present in, in public life. I wouldn't say they serve necessarily the nationalist or the regime, but rather they are uh, bystanders, bystanders. So for that reason, um, this announcement, you know, comes as a surprise because it portrays 
you know, Bosnia as if it's a some sort of a hotbed of of LGBT rights and promotion and whatnot. Whereas in reality, I mean, we have a long way to go here in promotion of LGBT rights and in in uh, building a more inclusive and and uh, better society. Okay, I understand. I understand. Okay, so let's let, let, let's check us. Um, actually, uh, Mr. Mr. Pachkao, um, um, could you now, uh, on the basis of what you heard um, of previous speakers, also describe the situation? Uh, actually, you are based in United Kingdom. You have the um, uh, you know the the freedom to to talk whatever you want. Uh, but I guess um, um, your um, um uh, 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 let's say co um uh, national co uh, um, 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 uh, individuals like people from Belarus cannot um or um am i wrong voice please can you can you start your voice i can, um i cannot hear you you okay, muted it's okay it's okay, it's okay now uh, yeah, yeah, you, you are absolutely correct. And uh, just uh, on the related uh, uh, matter, I would just uh, comment very briefly on uh, what uh, Professor Lukianova mentioned. Uh, it needs to be remembered that the European Humanities University in Vilnius, uh, a very large institution um, by comparison, uh, it, it has been there since the late 1990s. Uh, academic freedom in Belarus has been uh, under pressure. Uh, to put it mildly, since the late 1990s. And it, so it was addressing a very long term problem uh, for the last 20 years. And um, I think, unfortunately, it would have been very difficult to replicate uh, that now. Uh, although, of course, I mean, that needs to be uh, worked with. Uh, and I, I, wish, I wish all success uh, in anyone's trying. Now, um, speaking of, uh, um, yes, yeah, some of our previous speakers uh, have mentioned, uh, I think uh, initially there were two questions rather than one. Um, speaking of um, what uh, NGOs can do in the current climate for the promotion of uh, human rights, uh, speaking of specifically Belarus, um, well, in Belarus there are virtually no independent NGOs left um, after the um, uh, 2020 events. No matter what you do, uh, for example, the Society for the Protection of Birds uh, has been shut down um, by the regime uh, on political grounds, uh, just simply for being independent. But of course, human rights and educational organization, organizations have been uh, the primary uh, victims of that repression. And organizations like uh, the ASNA and other human rights monitors um, uh, have been all declared extremist organizations and there are uh, an, an automatic jail sentence, uh, many years um, in jail uh, penalties for any in, in involvement uh, with them, which is which is legally um, a charge. The charge would be uh, as um, adding and abetting uh, an extremist organization activity. Uh, so the Belarusian human rights and geo infrastructure has now survived outside of Belarus. And that leads me to, the, to my second uh, you know, set of comments, that what can be done to promote uh, human rights. For human rights uh, and NGOs, uh, human rights organizations and NGOs at large in Central Eastern Europe and elsewhere, um, my observation would be like this. Uh, now, uh, politically, it's the uh, defense uh, think tanks and NGOs work in that field who have uh, the ear of the politicians, and other policy makers and decision makers. That's, that's the reality. There's a, a war going on. So um, as I've argued, um, uh, in the context of the war in particular, um, this has, uh, uh, human rights have certain security and uh, defense implications too. And without unduly securitizing uh, the human rights agenda, it is uh, only fair and uh, in fact, 
correct to highlight the place and significance of human rights agenda uh, in the war and defense context. And I think uh, it would be very timely and justified to do so and to try to engage with uh, the uh, defense uh, think tanks uh, on that in that field. Mm, uh, so it would be just uh, very justified uh, intellectually and not just uh, some opportunistic tactics uh, because there's a war now. Uh, <clears throat> so speaking of um, Belarus and the, uh, the, free, the academic freedom situation, uh, no, there is none left. Um, on the one hand, it would be unfair to say that uh, only committed Lukashenko supporters have now been not fired or not forced to resign. Uh, it's only those um, in uh, Belarusian higher education um, institutions who uh, had some evidence against them, evidence of disloyalty, um, who have been fired or forced out. Uh, so I think that with with suitable due diligence, uh, it's probably still worthwhile uh, maintaining links with anyone suitable. But the, the, the other side of this is that one needs to be very careful not to place those people at risk because anyone who has any uh, links with uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, with the West or, or with uh, any independent NGOs would be a suspect in uh, in Belarus. Uh, so um, I, I only wish uh, that that had been kept in mind before the 2020 events. Uh, I think obviously uh, uh, people did not have the expectations that the repressions would come about with such severity but um, had uh, some uh, foundations uh, who were supporting independent academic uh, work, uh, research, uh, basically academic freedom, and those had to be more careful and had they considered that uh, the situation could have a turn to, to the worst, then probably uh, some people would have been safer in Belarus. But well, it just, it's just a lesson uh, to learn from the situation. Now, uh, and my last uh, comment would be this, Belarusian uh, intellectual and cultural uh, products can now uh, be created in some sectors exclusively outside of Belarus and then uh, repatriated uh, in an electronic form uh, to the audience in Belarus. So uh, Belarusian human rights and um, academic community needs to be uh, in, the, in exile need to be engaged with and supported as um, uh, at least some of them and their students will repatriate and uh, those will be the people who will be shaping the future public opinion in Belarus uh, when there is a new government for whom public um, opinion uh, will matter. So that is another point that uh, support the Belarusian exile um, uh, human rights and academic community. And I'm sure uh, Professor Lukiana would also argue the same uh, from the Russian. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your comments. Um, so we are now um, coming to a, um, to a close, closing part of, the, of this event. Um, Actually, it um, it went much quicker than I expected. You know, um, I thought that we'll be like in hour and a half we'll be finished, but um, I could actually go on for another half an hour. But I know that it's more or less the time that we slowly um, conclude. Um, so I'm I'm actually going to ask you all of you if you have any um, um, last um, last remarks or last um, let's say I. Um, uh, comments. Um, actually, the, 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 as um, Anna in the beginning said, um, the purpose of this event is uh, establishing communication, either again or a little bit stronger between Eastern, Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, and um, the basic, uh, actually, we are going back to basics, to communication uh, of 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 you know debating situation which is currently um happening in europe and um 
only communication and dialogue can at the end are going to um, are is going to finish the aggression and also uh, transform the communities the um, nations um so um with this in mind if if you have any um comment on what i just said on the um on the purpose and the uh, um and the uh, um importance of um, dialogue and communication i'll give you the word otherwise um, i'll conclude myself so um, please um, eric you're the first it's it's never easy to conclude somehow after after an event so the the only thing uh, what i can express that i i cannot agree more that these kind of collaboration cooperation and communication is uh, is very important amongst uh, amongst the the NGOs and the the civil society organizations. And what I always uh, used to highlight that the democratic development is not a one way road. So there's a there's a sometimes there's a U turn. So actually, uh, this is all. I think it's also important that we have to we have to watch and monitor those countries as well which are for example members of the Euro european union uh, and uh, and i think in this context hungary is a is a warning sign so and obviously i'm very grateful for being part of this project also the the publication and these uh, public events so thank you very much thank you eric so, Ms. Lukianova, any any last word of the on the importance of uh, on importance of communication and the dialogue? Uh, I only want to add that uh, we are all, all the university is very grateful to take part uh, in in this discussion and this uh, uh, publication. Thank you very much, and uh, we will be happy to to work together because the communication is is very very important now nowadays. Thank you too uh, for the contribution uh, and um, for the debate today. Um, and um, uh, I hope at some point that we will also um, do it live. Um, uh, Online is one opportunity, but um, having a live conversation is even better. Uh, but Miss Lukiano, I thank you for your contribution. So Nedim, any last words? Um, can I comment? Um, I would say, um, uh, yes, thank you for uh, inviting me for evolution contribution. Um, it's, it's a form of communication and it should uh, uh, continue uh, in this uh, in this way, I think um, it's a very valuable opportunity. Um, what I think uh, on a larger point is that uh, well, we need to take a historical perspective that sooner or later the war will be over, and uh, if uh, the human rights agenda and the promotion of human rights and uh, democracy and liberal values is not the top of the agenda for for this current uh, situation reasons, so no, sooner or later something will change historically. And uh, we need to keep uh, the capability and develop the capability for the time when these uh, matters can be again put on the forefront of attention for politicians, decision ma uh, makers, and societies. So uh, keep up the work and uh, let the wall. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Pachkayo. Um, I'm glad uh, we had you on this discussion, and uh, I hope we'll be able to. Um, uh, let's say um, 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 continue with uh, with our cooperation further on. So thank you very much. Uh, now, Nedim, um, please, um, you are the last, not least, but um, uh, the last. Um, uh, you know, concluding this uh, this event, uh, I, I have the last word. You know, that's that's for me. But anyhow, please, Nedim. Yeah, so not much really that I want to add at this point, just that I'm looking forward to the continuation of this dialogue and uh, to bringing the human rights agenda back to the forefront where it belongs. Uh, thank you for having me, and I hope we collaborate together later.
Yeah, so thanks to all our speakers, um, it was a real experience talking to you. Um, uh, it's always nice, um, even though that it's online, you know, to have an international um, panel uh, with different, uh, with all the all the experience from around Europe and the world, and um, these uh, events um, organized by us, let's say, political foundations are um, capable of producing this. So yeah, thank you again. Um, this event is going to be accessible on our dedicated web page. Uh, human rights in the 21st century, where you can also check the publication, individual articles, and many other articles, video interviews, blog and discussion and events we produced in the last few years. And we are still going to try to uh, focus and, uh, and, and um, publish more relevant information and news. Uh, not just in the context of the current uh, um, developments, but also on pressing issues as artificial intelligence, um, climate change, and so on. So thank you again to all of you uh, for this uh, wonderful time. And uh, I hope to see you soon at some live event. And uh, I also am um, looking forward to the continuation of this um, project and uh, the context of human rights. So thank you and uh, good night.